Great. Well, thank you guys so much for, for joining. I really appreciate it. It's a wonderfully distinguished panel that we have uh, with me today. Uh, so I'm going to go from my right again. Uh, to my right, we have Philippe Luethi, who is Head of Investment for Switzerland at Aon. Philippe has spent 17 years as both a local and international investment consultant and specialises in asset manager selection as well as asset and liability analysis. To his right, we have Tim Edwards, Managing Director of Index Investment Strategy at S&P Dow Jones Indices. In that role, Tim helps produce research and commentary about the firm's indexes. Prior to that, he worked for Barclays Capital on exchange-traded products and index-linked derivatives. And to his right, uh, we have Sanjay Rao. Sanjay is product manager for Bloomberg Barclays Indices in Europe. Prior to Barclays, Sanjay was a director in the index portfolio and risk solutions team at Barclays, where his primary focus was on the research and development of fixed income indices. So thank you very much all for joining us. Um, you'll have noticed a certain rhythm to the proceedings by now. Um, so we're going to start with, I'm afraid, another poll. Um, so I hope it will spark a, a lively conversation. But if you're able to, to get out your apps uh, and join me here. Uh, the question is, which asset class has the most room for index innovation? Which asset class has the most room for index innovation? So you've got equity there, fixed income, commodities, and alts. Interesting to see the initial results. I have a feeling we might end up in that direction anyway, but equity is making a bit of a comeback. Interesting. Give it a couple more seconds. Oh. All right, we'll call it there. That is very interesting, as pretty much every other country uh, we've been in so far has gone with fixed income first and then alt second. So I'm interested to see that the equity is getting a, a strong bid here, maybe even the strongest bid, um, just given kind of uh, the potential, I guess, there for ESG. I'll be uh, interested to talk to my panelists there about that and, and also about kind of smart beta and factor investing. Um, so obviously, we now have uh, more than 3.7 million indexes worldwide, which is a huge number. Uh, more than 400,000 of those were created in just 12 months. This is a, a great stat that the um, Index Industry Association put out last year. Always blows my mind. Uh, and I want to, to, to get, get the panelists' thoughts really on why we're seeing kind of so many indexes kind of being created now. Um, Tim, where do you kind of see demand? Where are, are clients and asset managers looking for you to create indexes? So I think you can, you can tie it into some of the comments from the earlier panel about the real innovation in ETFs being not so much in <coughs> products but in users. So the growing adoption in, in the retail market uh, and the changing use in the institutional market. Um, and for that different kinds of core product holding, ESG is obviously a big uh, innovation space for us. It's where we've been investing a lot. Uh, we're not there yet with ESG. There's no absolute hero product. There's a lot of innovation that still needs to be done. Um, moving to the, the retail side, one of the more interesting developments that we've seen in the past 12 months is the introduction of essentially structured payouts. Uh, so some kind of buffering, using derivatives or options to deliver a structured payout. Uh, and certainly for the European markets, the ability to have greater control over risk and potentially capital protection is a really big part of the, the retail market. So innovations in those two areas, in terms of the types of payouts, uh, in terms of ESG, have been driving a lot of our investment. Interesting. And Sanjay, uh, I know you have a lot of expertise on the fixed income side, so um, perhaps you could give us a little bit of a walkthrough of, of where you've been seeing interest. So uh, I think in the ESG side and fixed income, we launched our fixed income ESG family in 2013. And back then, I would go to ESG conferences where you'd see an asset manager's name emblazoned on every wall. A week later, you'd go to see the fixed income prime, uh, portfolio manager from that asset manager, and he would ask you what ESG was. <laughs> there was a huge disconnect between what fixed income understood by ESG and what the ESG office and the equity side were doing. Over the last five years, that's completely changed. They, they walk into the meetings hand in hand. They clearly understand what they're trying to produce. And what we've seen over the last three or four years is an evolution across the market. So in the US, there's more of a focus on the ESG as an active strategy. In Europe, it's more concentrated around the idea that this is a socially responsible investment. But as that socially responsible investment develops, you have regional differences. Um, so you talk to European investors, say, in, in France, and with, with concerns about um, fossil fuel usage, they, they would say that nuclear power was the solution. Then you talk to the uh, Germans and they say nuclear power was the problem. <laughs> so there was a huge disconnect in each region, but what we've seen is that that market has coalesced and now they're trying to find simple solutions across the board 
for um, things like fossil fuel. The European Parliament are also working on trying to de define legislation on what is a low carbon benchmark. So it's a trajectory and we're moving across it. So I think that we're developing through that at the moment. Interesting. Okay, so ESG, defined outcome uh, products, uh, ESG fixed income. Interesting. Philippe, obviously you work as an asset manager. What sort of indexes are you looking for uh, and that perhaps these guys should be focusing on? Yeah, so because my clients are mostly pension funds, it's a little bit a different mm -hmm. way. So we usually start with a strategic asset allocation. This is then the definition, what categories they are using. And with that, uh, we need indexes because indexes are for us tools to measure or better to compare um, how their uh, implementation is doing. Now, my answers are specifically for Switzerland because it's a little bit a special market. So in the pension fund field, it's all about having low cost and the local competitor, which really owns the market, they love uh, low cost uh, and passive implementation. So this would speak for ETFs and many different index indices. But because um, most of the investors, the pension funds, are at two global custodian, the two big ones, and they have also the passive products, so usually, they are somehow stick in this little world or universe because if they get out with um, say oh we would like now to go in this thematical direction and this uh, it's difficult for them to implement and then the cost go up so it's really um, two aspects which indices for us as a consultant is a comparing tool and still if you have a client who is willing to go a different way or different down a different road it's very helpful if there is an index index uh, in the market because this is then the second question uh, which index do we follow <laughs> so and then it's very helpful if there is a passive product because in the traditional market as equities fixed income um, you, you save some fees, so you try to implement it passively, and you do it actively more in the alternative space or real estate. And there, as a consultant, where I really see most uh, innovation, I mean, which I would like, there is more innovation. There is a lot of innovation in equity and fixed income, but where I need it as a consultant is in alternatives. So. I still wait on a really reliable and good private equity index or private debt or say real estate um, opportunistic or core plus. So because there usually you have the problems of measuring it, comparing it, and then because the investors, the pension fund investors who take decision are not professionals. So they need somehow something which is close to the portfolio to measure it or to compare it. I think, I think you know, yeah. Philippe really has brought out a key distinction, um, uh, if, if I may, between indices and benchmarks. Um, there are, as you say, more than 3 million indices. There are not 3 million benchmarks. Uh, and the difference between an index that I use in order to judge my own performance or, or perhaps as a, you know, a watermark for am I doing a good job can be very different to uh, what do you actually invest in pass passively. Um, and, and topics like uh, risk parity, real estate, um, private capital markets, there may well be a benchmark, but the probably, you know, the, the challenge in creating an investable index in that space um, is, is a whole different matter. Actually, so just to reiterate, yeah. slight different focus, a lot of the usage in the conversations we've heard previously uses index as a synonym for passive, and that's not what it is. An index is the investable universe for a particular asset class. And it's used to create the level playing field that an active manager can show their outperformance and a passive manager can show their ability to replicate the beta. And that's what it is. It's a, it's a mirror that you can hold up to all asset managers and say, where do you stand in this mirror? Or how do you look in this mirror? That's a great distinction to, to make. And I'm curious, though, just given kind of that it has been challenging to create these uh, indexes for kind of private debt, for real estate, for kind of private markets, how do you guys think that that is going to sort of develop over time? Are, are steps being made forward to be able to do that, or is it something that's very challenging still? Well, so, I mean, if you take the fixed income experience, so um, if, if you look at it, compare it to equity, say, um, on, in terms of the 
the data underlying the terms and conditions on. There's one listed equity, <coughs> JP Morgan, there's 70,000 bonds. If you look at liquidity, you have um, on the equity side, the ESMO ruling said that there were 1,500 liquid equity securities in Europe, and there are 470 out of 70,000 in the, um, the fixed income side. And the scale on the, the alternatives is much wider and much larger. So once you're getting into the thing where a fixed income is difficult, I think actually indexing alternative is going to be very hard. Potentially, that's one of the reasons why people are investing in alternatives, because you don't have that pressure to um, transact all the time. I think that's what John Hegarty was saying earlier. The, the, the movement towards active management and then to trade all the time is something that's potentially something that's more, more difficult. You touched on fixed income there. Philippe, I wonder if I can come to you on that. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism uh, of fixed income indexes um, over time. You know, the fact that you're, you're buying kind of uh, the companies that are most indebted uh, if you're buying a market cap weighted uh, fixed income index. How do you guys kind of look at those um, as indexes, as benchmarks? And what would you like to see in terms of products that, that can be used to, to potentially move beyond that whole market cap? Yeah, uh, aspect. this is exactly a uh, dis discussion I regularly have with clients is um, they want to implement a fixed income um, bucket passively and then I ask them do you really want to buy everything which is inside and this is usually the start of an of a interesting discussion uh, which circles a little bit and then it's always the question what kind of uh, possibility do we have to implement and then I, I tell them it's loads of them are in the market. But then the next question is, what is our global custodian providing? And then suddenly the universe of different solution is very small. Then you have the global egg, you have the corporate, and then maybe you have some fundamental uh, index, uh, indexed product, and that's it. So it's difficult to, to move them. Um, I mean, in a discussion, they see the point, but then the implementation to really move them to a different way of implementing fixed income is, is very difficult. Yeah. Especially in Switzerland, because we as Aon, we just own a very small, we are a niche player in investment sure. consulting. So this is something probably PPC metrics could move, uh, but it's just us, we can start the discussions, but not the, the move. <laughs> So I, th I think the difficulty is in fixed income, unlike equity, it's, it's very difficult to get the actual return that you're expecting because of the transaction cost. And so the, we, what we've seen is uh, any adjustment to the market cap uh, makes it difficult to replicate. So we've looked at the various solutions, and but the, they haven't really gathered many assets. But one of the key things that we've seen is that there's been a move towards the equity side factor indices where a value momentum trend carry. Um, and what we're seeing is that we, we've done some research where there is potentially some way of implementing that where the increased transaction costs will still give you an outperformance that's potentially attractive. And there are asset managers that are looking at it. But it's, again, a conversation that needs to be had with the investors, and it's a conversation with the asset managers as well to build products. It's taken five years for ESG to develop. I think we're only at the starting point on fixed income um, factor indices to, to go forward now. I'd, I'd like to pick up on something around that concept of uh, fixed income being the most indebted. Um, and, and there's this... Uh, to give you a, one example, so I often read that um, the passives or ETFs are inflating bubbles in certain parts of the market, and, and the high yield market is one example of this. And it may be true that energy companies you know, are a certain proportion of the capitalization of a high yield bond index. But let's think about why they are that proportion. They have captured that amount of assets from active managers. If they're 20% of the market, that is because active players in the bond market have decided that the aggregate value is 20%. Passive investors just track the market. And that, that concept that active investors are the police and passive investors participate in the consequences of their decisions is universal. And if you know, the most indebted companies are too indebted, the price of their bonds will go down. Uh, and this is, you know, something that I just, I just read a lot of perhaps misconceived uh, opinions on this. Uh, and actually, all the indices do is reflect the aggregate consensus of active investors. Uh, and actually, to reiterate that point, 
you know, you can issue as much debt as you want, but the price that you have to issue it at is defined by how much people are willing to pay. So the largest issuers, uh, unless their uh, foundations are solid, they pay a much higher premium. It's not a reflect. You know, if you look at the largest issuers in the, the investment grade universe, they're all the strong names that you would expect. It's not going to be the poorly rated names. It's going to be the significant names. Philippe, does that reassure you about, about um, how those are constructed? No, it's, it's probably a little bit this egg and hen discussion because what I see, the typical investor, um, I mean, first, you're right, to start a certain weight of, of, a, of a, say, uh, somebody who is giving out uh, bonds uh, is from the active managers, but then uh, the money which follows is from passive investors. And this is a massive flow because the pension fund um, investors in Switzerland who take the decision are not asset managers. I mean, they don't see single positions. They just see the category, the index, and they just pour money in it. So then it's coming. And this then, of course, can put down the price. But I think um, I'm not completely agreeing with you, but not disagreeing. So it's, it's really a question. Um, I think, if I, if I may, well, just to continue on this for yeah. a little bit. Um, so, so, for example, an ETF linked to a high-yield market, um, they often have quite high trading volumes. Those trading volumes are not uh, con new converts to passive investing who are going to buy that fund and hold it in perpetuity and hope to be, to be rich in 40 years. It's active investors, largely. Mm -hmm. uh, the European ETF market is quite institutional. It's used very tactically. So if you sort of throw your arms up and say, oh, there's, there's flows coming into my asset class and I'm worried about that, well, that's a very, very valid point, but it's probably not passive investors. Yeah, especially not in global high yield. I was more referring to, you know, the Swiss bond index uh, universe or the global ag. And the problem also with global ag, if you try to take out some segments in Switzerland, as an example, in global ag, you have European e ABS. So this could be a, a nice segment for the investor to concentrate on that and reduce the government bond sector. But as soon in Switzerland as you go in this specific segment, it's, um, it's looked at from the regulator as alternative. And this is something which in Switzerland, some of the investors, they are afraid of having too much alternatives. So that's keeping them into the global ag. So this is a little bit um, on a green field, I'm completely with you, <laughs> but unfortunately, there are so many different um, special circumstances for the main uh, part of the, the pension fund investors in Switzerland. I mean, this is really uh, what I'm seeing here. I, I don't know about Germany or how it's in, in UK. Well, this is, this is a great illustration, I think, of kind of like just uh, what the debate in, in Europe has to become, is because everything is quite fragmented, it's having that conversation in kind of a, a sort of domestic context uh, mm. as well as kind of a, a sort of European context. Sanjay, you look like you had a, a, something to add there as well. Well, so I, I think the, the important thing is it's important to remember the first point is the asset allocation. So the index itself is reflecting the market. So the global ag is just trying to say, what is that investable universe? If the asset allocation isn't in a position to actually be replicated because of concerns about liquidity, uh, then that's a separate issue that needs to be addressed from the, the investor perspective, I think. The index itself is just trying to look at the mirror itself. I want to dive a little bit uh, into just kind of the, the business of, of indexing. You know, we, we spoke on the, the panel uh, earlier about kind of how many asset managers have been coming into the ETF space looking to kind of launch products. It's been a similar kind of situation kind of on the indexer side as well. A lot of new players kind of coming into the market. And I wonder, Tim or Sanjay, whether you could talk a little bit about kind of just how the business model for indexing is changing a little bit. Uh, I think we did some calculations last year, and I think that the big three indexers kind of sort of pull in about $2 billion in revenue. You from, from indexing uh, every year, but obviously there are now new startups, um, you know, Selective, for example, springs to mind that are trying to undercut and get into the model. How does that kind of change the, the universe for, for you guys as more established players in thinking about what you do focus on and how you develop your indexes? Uh, from Bloomberg's perspective, I mean, the, we see indexes as based on five strong pillars. So you have data, <laughs> pricing, um, analytics, research, and distribution. And Bloomberg's invested heavily in all of those functions to be able to give a, a quality product a, in you know, a reasonable cost. I think there's a lot of understanding that there's cost pressures across the board, but there's a, you know, we've talked about innovation previously. 
everyone wants new products, and everyone wants to be able to offer new types of products. To be able to do that, you need scale. You need to be able to look at the different asset classes and invest in them. ESG, five years ago, like I said, fixed income had no interest in it. We needed to make the investment. We needed to make the understanding of, of potential growth and see how that works. So I think it's important that you, know, you understand that you need someone that can provide all of the different pillars in a concrete way in a stable platform uh, with a good quality product. And Tim, you know, we, we've seen it in the US uh, a trend, uh, an emerging trend perhaps towards sort of self-indexing with some asset managers kind of looking to sort of do it themselves. Like, how do you guys kind of view that? Is, is that a threat? Is it something that can kind of coexist with the big indexes? Um, well, so we, we did a count uh, quite recently and, and counted, I think there's around 330 different index providers wow. uh, who currently offer products, uh, indices that are used by products. Um, that, that is a big change. I mean, it, it wasn't that 20 years ago. Um, and obviously, there is more competition. It's a very robust marketplace. I think for some of the smaller or nascent index providers, um, they might also be using one of the more established brands as a benchmark administrator, for example. Um, what people might not realize is, is the amount of work that goes into calculating an, ind an index. I mean, all the, the corporate actions and just sort of monitoring the markets. Um, and then also having that within a robust structure, right? So that you know, they should be Chinese walls away from the commercial side. So, so there is a lot more competition. I think when you come back to the, uh, the, key, the, the idea of, you know, but then this is quite concentrated, actually. The assets are quite concentrated. That kind of makes sense. It suits everyone to have a certain few very liquid, widely referenced benchmarks. Um, and the self-indexing trend... Um, I think we have to be quite careful about uh, one of the earlier uh, panelists mentions, you know, proliferation can, can invite regulation or can run risks. I think it's really important to, to me as an investor that when I buy a product and it's linked to an index, that there is, I have a great degree of comfort that there's no conflicts of interest between the product provider and the index provider. I'm not saying that can't be done with self-indexing, um, but I will say that, that I think having a third-party index provider is potentially a very good thing. Philippe, perhaps you could weigh in on that a little bit, just in terms of kind of like when you're thinking about indexes and thinking about benchmarks, like how, how much scrutiny are you giving kind of the, the provider of, of those um, gauges before you actually decide to, to use them? Yeah, it's a good question. So <laughs> usually um, it's always you have the strategic asset allocation. I go back again into the, say, um, global ag, so it means for the Swiss pension fund, global fixed income, then usually just the biggest main and plain vanilla index is used as a benchmark. So this would be the, the bar cap global ag. And, and that's usually most of the time that's it, full stop. And some of them, they are open to add some thematical uh, segments or products. And then for that, you have to use uh, of course, then the index which goes to the product. But it's usually always first um, the, the segment, then the product, and then the index. So this is typically how, how the, 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 the steps are, are done. So it's not like, oh, we are just going from bottom up, buying a product, taking the index, and then consolidating everything. It, it's, it's more coming from, from the bigger ones. And because most of them are not in-house managers, they are not running after different thematical or uh, different um, ways and flavors. It, they are usually, usually staying in the, in the big main plain vanilla segment and passively. But what I see, um, and this is something I, I will also discuss, and we have already discussed with a lot of uh, clients, is the ESG uh, aspect. So they are open to see, oh, is there an ESG-flavored uh, plain vanilla index which we could use a benchmark, and then also with the implementation. So you see a very slow and, and, and small steps, but it's more like the, the big themes, like ESG. It's not like, oh, uh, we have now to add momentum or, or whatever, because this is more for a pension fund who has an in-house management <laughs> team, which is deciding what kind of factors they are playing. Usually this is delegated to an asset manager. 
and then the whole asset manager is put in a category and this category is usually MSCI world full stop. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so um, so I think all these different indices and ben which, which you can use as a benchmark is like it's a tool for measurement which centimeters but with a typical pension fund you have a tool who measures you know in the meter scale because you stay in these big blocks. I'm already happy if clients are willing to go into satellites mm. and but usually you don't go then further into smaller pieces. So Jay, it looks like you'd like to jump in there, yeah. So yeah, uh, I think to that point that about you know, there are lots of different providers who really provide very similar types of indices. But the important thing to remember is that the index is a conversation between all the different market participants to define what is the, the, the appropriate universe. So the, it's the way that they function to talk to each other. So for us in our governance panel, what we do is every year we have um, councils in New York, London, um, Singapore, and Hong and Tokyo to discuss a range <coughs> of different issues. And I, I'm sure all providers have this sort of um, governance panel where you have the discussion about what are the range of issues that need to be addressed and what's the solution so that the market can actually coalesce around an agreement on what they think the big picture is. And then for around then the different asset managers and different consultants can then choose how they want to use on the, the measure on the centimeters. But you need everyone to coalesce around a big uh, product to make that discussion um, on the centimeters happen. In a sense, we've, we've kind of come full circle and we open with talking about ESG as, as one of the spaces. And Philippe, you, you just mentioned, you said, you know, what is my vanilla ESG option? It's, yeah. it's very unusual to look across <coughs> the investment space and there's, there's no vanilla option. There's no kind of, here's my, if you like, don't think about it choice or my obvious benchmark. Um, and that definitely is something where I think the, the conversation is still evolving um, and where uh, the index providers are all actually investing quite heavily. In fixed income, I, I, I'd say the progression is slightly different. Though. So what we saw was originally lots of ETF providers were looking to produce a product that had a specific requirement, either sustain, ESG rated or socially responsible screening. Now all the products are pretty much agreed on the same thing, a combination of the two. It's the market has decided that they want to coalesce around one uh, style of index, which happens to replicate broadly the core allocation. But again, indexes as a conversation between participants as the, uh, the conduit, effectively. Well, Tim mentioned that we come full circle, and we are running out of time, <coughs> but I, I have one last kind of thought for, for all of you. I'm curious as to, as to whether you think there's anything that can't be indexed, whether there, are, there is a limit to passive that once we've kind of got all our ESG sorted, we've, we've delved through fixed income, that actually the, there are places that the passive cannot go. Um, any thoughts? Well, so some examples that, that are typically used in these conversations, things like private equity. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I should say we have a listed private equity index. It's the actual private equity companies and it's performed rather admirably. Um, but the concept that there will always be alpha, always things that you just cannot get in an index, um, I think is, is true. Much of what used to be alpha is now considered beta, and particularly in the, in the factor space. When you talk about you know, deeply idiosyncratic, unlisted, where the real value is in, is in the decisions of company managers and private equity managers, um, I can't imagine a way that that could be satisfactorily mm -hmm. indexed. Sanjay, do you agree? Similarly, yeah. So data, pricing, analytics, what exactly are these in, in private equity? And that's the thing where you know, that, that may be part of the attraction, but that's the, the issue that we face. Yeah. Uh, probably the problem is you have to put so much effort and cost to produce an index, which at the end you can't not implement. So what is the sense to producing it? It would be great for me as a consultant to have a, a comparing measurement system, but you are not producing just indices just for fun <laughs> so, <laughs> or just for comparison. Yeah. So I see um, that there is definitely private equity will probably always be a special field in the index situation aspect. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, I think, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. So thank you guys so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Please join me in thanking my panelists.